So this is part two of the NeuroRound series of three. So the way I thought I'd structure this talk today is to take the first half and talk about a general approach to vertigo um, in a way that I thought our curriculum really didn't address all that well. And the second part is going to be spent just teaching um, how to actually do a HINTS exam. So just a reminder, this is the series. Um, also just quickly wanted to let you know that the talk after this is not going to be next Tuesday, but it's going to be on actually mid-February when I'm back from my CARMS tour. And um, just my usual little plug that uh, because I'm still a fourth year, there's lots I have to learn. I did double check all my content with Dr. Bauman and she's approved everything that I'm going to show you today to be factually accurate. So may as well get started. The first thing I want to talk about is this approach that we were taught um, back during our DAL curriculum from what I recall on how to differentiate between vertigo and dizziness. So what, from what I remember, what we were taught is that you ask your patient whether they mean that they're lightheaded um, or whether the room is spinning. And depending on what they told you, um, it would take you into the direction of either more of a cardiac diagnosis, like an arrhythmia, or a neuro or neuroautological diagnosis. So um, when I went into electives and started using this approach, I actually got corrected very quickly that this approach is rather outdated. And the reason for this is that there have been a lot of studies actually looking at this approach, and they found that when they took a patient history and then repeated it just 30 minutes later, patients would actually start using completely different words uh, and actually lead you to an entirely new diagnosis. And this happened over and over and over again. So that's why the characterization by words right now is more outdated and is very vulnerable to getting, um, leading you to get your diagnosis wrong. So the more neurology approved novel approach is the timing and trigger method. So the, usually you elicit this in your history anyway, but you want to pay really close attention to when was the onset, if they can recall, and what triggers it. And based on what you elicit in this, you can fit your differential or your, your patient into one of four diagnostic buckets. So these are the four that you're usually left with. So we have the acute constant, transient positional, recurrent spontaneous, and chronic progressive. I have two bells there because these are kind of the red flag categories that you want to pay particular attention to. Um, but other than that, I'm just going to go through each bucket because each bucket has its own differential diagnosis. So that's why it's pretty important to know which bucket your patient fits into. So bucket one um, should always make you worried. So acute constant means that usually the, your patient can tell you exactly when it started. So sometimes they even have like a, um, a time of the day. Um, and it's completely unremitting. So ever since it started, they haven't had a single minute without symptoms. Um, they can still be waxing and waning, but they haven't been symptom-free. The reason that this should set off alarm bells is that there are some concerning things in this differential. So the one that you want to worry about um, are the strokes. So one would be either an ischemic stroke of the posterior circulation. So I'm borrowing here a little bit from my last talk, but remember the posterior circulation includes the brainstem, the cerebellum, and the occipital lobes. So you can have ischemia or you can have a bleed. So we would, you can say um, like a hemorrhage of the posterior circulation or a posterior fossa hemorrhage, which is the space that the posterior structures sit in. Um, and then you also have this acute labyrinthitis or vestibular neuritis. When I first learned this, I didn't really know what the difference was. Um, and then I was told that there isn't really one and people tend to use these terms pretty interchangeably. So this is an inflammation of the vestibular cochlear nerve that results in vertigo. It can have a similar presentation to stroke, but the one thing that tends to set it apart is that you have um, hearing loss. So unilateral hearing loss associated with this. Um, so if you have an acute constant vertigo without hearing loss, that's a major red flag and you need to investigate this patient for stroke. So this is your differential if you are truly acute. There are some patients that will kind of tell you, well, actually it's been more like a few days or maybe a week or two. Can't really remember when it started, but it's been constant and, and I'm, I've never been symptom free since. That's actually pretty specific. That's more of a subacute um, constant. And this is pretty specific for a vestibular neurotoxicity. So usually these patients will be vertiginous because of some kind of medication that they started. 
The usual culprits are listed here, so anticonvulsants, uh, lithium, uh, your tricyclics, antiarrhythmics, and then all your aminoglycoside antibiotics are very um, are common culprits too. So that's common, you know, if someone tells you, yeah, I had this viral illness or bacterial illness and then was given antibiotics, rightfully or not. Um, so pay attention to those. If you find that you're sitting in this bucket and you are starting to suspect a stroke, your workup is going to be similar to what we discussed in the last talk. So your first step would be a non-contrast CT head, because this is the best investigation to show you bleeds uh, as bright structures. And if your infarct is big enough and old enough, uh, it may actually also show you an inf um, ischemic stroke. The big difference between an anterior circulation, so what we talked about last time, and posterior circulation is that if your CT is negative, you should almost always follow it up with an MRI. And the reason is that um, the posterior structures, especially the brainstem, are a very small area and everything's kind of crammed together. So a lot of strokes aren't well visualized on CT. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, I'll show you a few CTs here. So um, the image on the left would sh show you a left-sided um, occipital lobe stroke. Um, so that's the patient's left, remember, and uh, you can see that very obvious dark area in the posterior cerebrum. Uh, the middle image is a cerebellar stroke. It's a bit more subtle, so you have the little arrow there. Um, so it would be a left-sided cerebellar stroke, uh, probably a little younger than the one on the left. And the third image is an MRI. The tricky part to remember here is that in an MRI, your colors are usually flipped if you go with the um, most common MRI sequence. So strokes will actually show up as bright. Um, so if you look at the central structure there, the pons, you can see that it kind of looks like it's half and half. So the infarcted area is actually the area on the patient's left, the bright area. So just to show you that sometimes for pontine infarcts and anything, especially in the medulla and the pons, you're gonna need an MRI to get at, especially if they're young. Um, also wanted to show you hemorrhages. So these are both CTs, not MRIs. Um, and remember on CT, blood is bright. So these are usually pretty hard to miss. And that should be your first priority to make sure that's not what's happening. I wanna quickly go into a brief clinical pearl. When I started these talks, I made sure that I wasn't going to go into localization and be a neurologist unless it absolutely mattered. So this is one of those cases where it really matters. Um, the Wallenberg syndrome is a lateral medullary infarct. So you've infarcted the lateral part of your medulla. The reason why it matters is that this is the most commonly missed stroke type that results in lawsuits for emergency physicians. Even though this is actually a very rare stroke, it is the one that most reliably tends to get missed. And that's because it tends to present, you know, with nothing but vertigo. But if you look at a cross section of the medulla, and if you were infarcting that lateral part, you're actually knocking out a lot more than just a vestibular nuclei. So you're knocking out your spinal thalamic tract, nucleus ambiguous, ambiguous. Basically, you don't need to worry about this. What you need to know is that vertigo um, in someone with lateral uh, medullary syndrome is accompanied by many other findings that can be extremely subtle, and that's why they're often missed. So that would be dysphagia. So trouble swallowing. These patients can actually be so dysphagic uh, that they can't even swallow their own saliva. So drooling is a major red flag. Um, dysphonia, so hoarseness, also red flag. Um, if you want to do more of a sensory exam, you can get contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation because you uh, wipe out your spinal thalamic tract. And you could also have an ipsilateral hoarseness. So you don't really need to remember all of this either. What you do need to remember is that if you have a vertiginous patient in your emergency department and you hear them either hiccup or drool, then you have a stroke until you prove it not so. So you need to order CT, CTA, MRI. And I would repeat a meticulous cranial nerve exam because that's gonna give you the biggest bang for your buck in terms of um, picking up these rather subtle findings that you may have otherwise missed. Um, other clinical pearl. Um, because a lot of the time we get this question, how do we know that vertigo needs a neurology consult? So vertigo should always go to neurology if you have, um, if you have it in combination with any of the following Ds. So 
dysphagia, so trouble swallowing, dysarthria, slurred speech, dysphonia, hoarseness, and diplopia, uh, double vision. Also, if you have any unilateral dysmetria, so we talked about that last time, so uh, remember on finger to nose testing, you miss your target, either the finger or your own nose, uh, and direction changing nystagmus, and I'll talk about that later when we talk about the HINTS exam. So um, that is the first bucket. The next two buckets are probably gonna be a bit faster. Um, so the next one would be the transient positional bucket. So these are symptoms of vertigo that come on uh, once in a while, but are reliably triggered by positional changes. So either um, lying to sitting, sitting to standing, um, and they completely go away in between. So the differential for this is actually very short. So usually this is um, a case of orthostatic hypotension or anything um, to do with cerebral hypoperfusion, or it's BPPV, which is the stereotypical diagnosis that we think of when we think vertigo. So a quick refresher, BPPV is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, and it's because of a displacement of the otoliths, which are the tiny um, little rocks that float around in your semicircular canals and tell you where you are in space. And if one of them gets dislodged, um, your inner ear doesn't know how to interpret that signal, and in turn gives you this subjective feeling of vertigo. Um, if you start to suspect, based on your history, that your patient has BPPV, that should actually get you super excited because it is one of the very, very, very few things that you can fix immediately. And um, you've probably been taught kind of the dix Hallpike versus Epley, and I'm gonna walk through it again. Um, but these can actually produce very miraculous recoveries within minutes, and I've seen it happen, and they're really wonderful. So um, I've picked on a volunteer here in Waterville. So, I'm going to walk you through the, di the difference between a Dix Hall Pike and an Epley. So actually what I'm going to get you to do, if you can, can you lie down this way? I'm going to make poor Natalie lie down on the table. Headwear. This, this way. I'll get my coffee out of the way. All right, so this is our makeshift table. You only to demonstrate if this is if you're horizontal. My head has to be yeah. off. No, nope, you're good. Yeah. Um, can anyone, can everyone see this in St. John? Like, I don't know how the, where the camera's pointing. Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, and I hope people watching at home can see this too. <laughs> so um, actually, I'm going to get started, start by getting you sit up. So we use the Dix Hall Pike test for diagnosis. Remember, D goes with D. Um, so you would use your Dix Hall Pike to diagnose. And your Dix Hall Pike is actually the first part of the Epley. So if it's positive, you can immediately transition to your Epley. So I'll show you what that means. So let's um, assume that Natalie, you're know, suspecting she has a right-sided BPPV. So you would do the right-sided Epley for this. And it's very easy to remember, you just point their head to the right. If it's right-sided, you point their head to the right. So if you could turn your head 45 degrees to the right. Good, and now, you should warn them that they're going to feel dizzy, but that it's going to go away. No. I'm going to, you're not going to feel dizzy because you don't have BPPV, Great. but other people will. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I just hate them now. No, <laughs> this shouldn't be too big a problem. So okay. what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold your head mm -hmm. and I'm going to get you to lie down, but make sure to keep your head in this position, okay? So just lie back. And the idea is that you kind of hold on to their head and it kind of falls off the table a little bit. You want it to be lower, just a little bit lower than the table. And here, usually they get very dizzy and you just reassure them, it's okay, just tell me when the dizziness is gone. And then you wait 30 seconds. So let's assume the 30 seconds is done. Mm -hmm. Now, the next step is just a 90 degree head turn to the left. So I'm gonna get you to turn your head just 90 degrees. You might get dizzy. Let me know when the dizziness goes away. So once again, 30 seconds for this. This part is kind of um, the most difficult one. So I'd say, okay, what I'm gonna get you to do is without sitting up or getting up, can I get you to roll onto your left shoulder and have your head pointing down to diagonally down towards the floor, exactly just like this. So their head stays in the same position. And once again, 30 seconds. And the last step is just, can I get you to uh, get your legs over the table and just sit up, keeping your head lower. Good. So this was an Epley maneuver. Um, that is the maneuver that actually repositions, like you are literally taking the little stone 
that is out of its semicircular canal and putting it out, like you're getting it out of there. So um, this was the Epley maneuver which you would use in a positive patient. The Dix Hall Pike was the initial part where she would lie backward. So I'm just going to do that quickly again because um, there's some misconception over what a positive Dix Hall Pike is. So can I get you to once again turn your head 45 and lie down. So in this case, what you actually kind of have to do is to gently hold their eyes open. I know that's a little sketchy, but what you're looking for is the positive finding is actually a type of nystagmus. So you're looking for either vertical or rotatory nystagmus upon lying down. And if that, if you get that positive, then you immediately transition into your epley. Does that make sense? And usually this will reproduce the symptoms, so they'll be very dizzy, they'll be, vert um, they'll be nystagmoid, etc. cetera. Um, but that is what your positive would look like. Thanks, Natalie. Your chance. Anytime. <laughs> awesome. All right. So this um, was bucket two. Bucket three, um, this one's a lot of peripheral type things, uh, as well as other systems. So if you have a recurrent spontaneous, a vertigo that's not reliably triggered by anything, it just comes completely out of nowhere, but resolves in between, these are the things you should be worrying about. So um, panic attacks are especially high on the differential if it's more of a lightheadedness and associated with any of the more psychiatric symptoms, so the sense of impending doom, uh, the subjective feeling of dying. Um, various cardiac things fit into this category, so many arrhythmias, um, near syncopal spells, etc. You can tell I'm not a cardiologist because that's all I'm going to say about that. And then um, the other one would be vestibular migraine. So vertigo can be both a presentation of a migraine and of migraine aura, which is also interesting. So if they, it's associated with headache, this is something you could keep in mind. But of course, if you have vertigo in context with headache, the first thing you'd want to exclude is a bleed. But this could be kind of on the back of your differential. Um, Meniere's disease is one of those cryptic ones that we learned about in Med 2. Not super important. Basically, you get these violent, really severe episodes of vertigo that only last a few seconds at a time and then resolve. Um, these are usually associated with hearing loss and ringing in the ear, so tinnitus. And the last one, I'm like, you don't really need to pay attention to it. It's because it's so rare, but it's a really cool one. So people with superior canal dehiscence syndrome will actually tell you funky things like I can hear my own pulse or I can hear my eyes move. And um, the way that you prove your diagnosis is their vertigo is actually provoked by startle. So you could be really mean in the middle of your history, just go and see if suddenly they get vertiginous. And then you've got this like amazing diagnosis of superior canal dehiscence syndrome. Um, but not super important to know, usually it's the neurologists that like do this and do the cruel things. So that's bucket three. Fun. I know. <laughs> it's I fun. start clapping I don't my ask vertigo. Clap at them nothing happens. <laughs> I know, I was like, sorry. <laughs> um, their vertigo also comes out, by the way, by, uh, through Valsalva. So if you want to be a little more gentle, you can be like, can you bear down? Or does it happen when you're on the toilet? Or can you cough? So a little more humane way to test for that. Um, bucket four is chronic progressive. Um, and the reason why, of course, anything that has chronic progressive on it should immediately trigger the thought of cancers. The most common cancers that present with uh, vertigo are tumors at the cerebellopontine angle, which is the fancy way of saying it's the little space where the cerebellum connects with the pons. And the most common tumor that grows there is um, an acoustic, acoustic neuroma. Um, these aren't actually all that malignant, but they are very symptom causing. So these are good to identify because you can just surgically remove them and get rid of their symptoms. Um, a chronic progressive can sometimes mimic uh, kind of a, a subacute chronic. So that's why drugs are once again in the same bucket and it's the same culprit as bucket one. And then there's inflammatory causes like lupus neuritis, Sussac, Hogan syndrome. Basically, the way you work this up if you're in this bucket is if you're suspecting a tumor, you would actually get an MRI brain with contrast. They're the ones that show these tumors best. Uh, for drugs, obviously, you just go to your history or your chart. And the inflammatory category, I really wouldn't worry about it. Like, this is where you refer to room. 
or neurology or sometimes even ENT and they will figure this out. Um, your job is to kind of just exclude everything that would be more reasonably to come before. So this is what an acoustic neuroma looks like. For some reason it has two names. So vestibular neuroma, uh, sorry, vestibular schwannoma and acoustic neuroma are the same thing. So on the left you can see it unilaterally, it's that white structure. Um, just a quick pearl that if you ever see a bilateral acoustic neuroma that is pathognomonic for a disease called neurofibromatosis type 2, and they will need urgent neurology referrals, also because they likely have bilateral hearing loss, and you need to get that tumor out of there very quickly. So that's the first part. So this is a general approach to vertigo, the different diagnostic buckets you can find yourself in and how to structure your workup based on your differential. The rest of the talk is going to focus on the HINTS exam. So for that, um, we need to first of all know what a HINTS exam is supposed to do. So the HINTS exam is a tool used in the emergency department that is supposed to allow you to differentiate between a central and peripheral cause of vertigo. So from these buckets that I just presented, some buckets actually had central and peripheral causes within them, but because HINTS is such a common clinical tool now, um, it's also a good idea to be able to talk about causes of vertigo in terms of central and peripheral. So I always kind of struggled with what is what even. So central causes of vertigo tend to be the ones that are bad, potentially life-threatening, and need urgent investigation or referral. So what we're talking about here is the strokes, so either ischemia or hemorrhage. Um, this is where we're talking about the tumors, but also the infections of the CNS and sometimes abscesses, as I'm sure you know, can mimic tumors pretty re um, reliably. The peripheral causes tend to be um, the more uncomfortable but not immediately life-threatening causes. So peripheral vertigo, I always found this a little counterintuitive, can actually be symptomatically much more severe than central. Um, so if you have someone who's really miserable in front of you, unfortunately that's kind of a, actually a good prognostic sign, um, but these people are gonna be very uncomfortable and these are the things that we talked about that they might have. So BPPV, that vestibular neuritis, Meniere's, superior canal, etc. So how do you differentiate between these two categories? So this is where you go to your hints. So the reason it's, um, it's called hints and it's spelled so weirdly is because it's an abbreviation. So it stands for head impulse, nystagmus, and test of skew. This is a three-part exam that you can do in less than a minute at the bedside and it comes alongside some pretty impressive numbers. So it is 97% sensitive and 84% specific in ruling out a central cause of vertigo. It's actually so good that if in the first 48 hours it outperforms MRI. Unfortunately, all the studies, when you actually look at them, um, are only valid in people who do a HINTS exam that are very good at interpreting these clinical signs. Usually that means neuro or neuroautology. And these tests usually aren't going to be done by these people, especially in rural sites. They're going to be done by emergency physicians, by family doctors, basically by you. So we need to get good at it, good at it in order for it to mean something. So I'll walk you through for the rest of the talk how to interpret a HINTS exam. So the first part of HINTS is a head impulse. So this is where you would take your patient's head in between both of your hands. So you put both your hands on their cheeks you kind of get, first move their head back and forth a little to get them used to you moving their head. You tell them to relax and to focus on your nose. Um, so no matter where I move, keep focusing on my nose. And then you give very gentle but rapid jerks. So you would go right and then you go left. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to see what their eyes are doing. So are their eyes fixated on your nose? Or do their eyes, when you turn to one side, need a while to catch up? So if they need a while to catch up, we call that a catch-up saccade. So you can see that on the bottom. Um, and I'll show you a video of this to just make it very clear what I'm talking about. The unfortunate part of the head impulse test is that it's sometimes kind of counterintuitive to interpret. Because a catch-up saccade is actually a peripheral finding. And that's because it's very common to knock out the inner ear centers um, and also take out the VOR, which is the uh, reflex that controls this catch-up saccade. So that means that an absent catch-up saccade in the presence of vertigo actually means that you're more likely looking at a central etiology. 
So the reason this is confusing is because most of you are probably thinking, well, when I would do this test, my eyes would stay fixated on a target, but I don't have a stroke. Um, and that is because you're not acutely vertiginous. So in the setting of acute vertigo that you believe would be due to an inner ear problem, you would expect for it to also knock out this reflex. So seeing the catch-up saccade is actually reassuring. Does that make sense? Or is that, I know this is kind of a weird idea to get your head around. It's one of those weird tests where um, a positive finding is actually reassuring. So it only applies when they actually have vertigo. Like, exactly, yeah. This only applies if your patient is acutely vertiginous. Okay. Yeah. So I'll show you what I mean, because I have a few videos here that I hoped would help in just kind of showing you this. Um, so this, I think, is some kind of crazy neurologist who did this to himself. But um, <laughs> usually you would actually be holding the patient's head in your, uh, in your hands and you would be doing the movements. But this was such a good video that I thought it might be really cool. So... He starts out, can everyone see this video, by the way? Okay, good, awesome. Um, so he starts out with just doing practice movements, so just loosening up the neck, focus on my nose, and then keeps focused, right? Doesn't lose sight of your nose. Mm -hmm. Other side, catch up. Oh. Catch up. <laughs> okay, well. I'm going to replay that just so everyone sees it. It's a very short video. So this is on the healthy side, stays focused. And turning on the right, catch up saccade. So would that be a left-sided issue or a right-sided? So this is a right-sided issue. Okay. Um, I find usually it's pretty, most of the things in acute vertigo are thankfully very intuitive. So if you turn your head to the right and find a finding, mm -hmm. then um, it's a right-sided problem. And then you would use a right-sided dix hall pike and a right-sided Epley. Does that make sense? Mm. So thankfully things are almost intuitive. <laughs> Um, despite sometimes being a little confusing. So this guy will probably have like this, I think is um, like a right-sided vestibular neuritis. So this is inflammation that knocked out his VOR, okay? Rika, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, absolutely. Is it, regardless of the type of nystagmus you have, like horizontal, vertical, or rotatory, like does that matter? Yeah, so that's actually a good question. So it's, it's sometimes hard to interpret this test when they really have horrible nystagmus because you can't, it's hard for them to fixate on your, uh, um, on your nose in the first place. So this is actually, uh, that's why it's so good in people with central, um, with central vertigo, because usually their nystagmus tends to be a little milder, so it's easier to actually do this test in people who you're worried about, if that makes sense. So, um, but yes, it is irrespective of the direction of the nystagmus, um, but we're actually gonna talk about nystagmus next, so that might clear it up a little bit. Um, so I'll just go back into presentation mode here. Um, right, so remember that absent catch-up saccade in the presence of vertigo is bad. Next is nystagmus. So in this category, you basically just need to be able to, uh, to differentiate between what, would, what is a central type nystagmus, what is a peripheral nystagmus. So peripheral nystagmus is unilateral or torsional. So what we mean by unilateral is that the, correct, uh, the direction of the corrective saccade, so the fast phase, is always in the same direction, no matter where your patient looks. So the directions that we test is primary gaze, so right in front of you, then you get them to follow to their right, and you get them to follow to their left. So if in all those gaze directions, you can, your nystagmus is always in the same side, it's um, unilateral nystagmus, okay? You can also have torsional nystagmus in this category, so that's where the entire iris actually kind of um, rotates like a steering wheel. And I have videos for all of these, um, which should make it a little clearer. Central nystagmus is direction changing. So what we mean by that is that when they look in one direction, the nystagmus beats in one direction, and when they look in the other, it changes and beats in the other direction. Um, the videos will make this a lot clearer because I remember I used to struggle with this quite a bit. Um, but you'll find that this is actually quite intuitive when you look at eyes. Um, another red flag is vertical nystagmus. With the exception of like a few um, quirky intoxications, vertical nystagmus is always a massive red flag for a central process. And you also have torsional nystagmus in this category. And that kind of begs the question, 
well, what is torsional nystagmus then? Unfortunately, it can be both. So if you see torsional, it can be both central peripheral, but there is a trick if you're ever in the situation in that peripheral nystagmus, uh, if it's torsional, can be suppressed. So what you would do is you'd get them to focus on your finger. And if the nystagmus increases or stays the same, then it's more likely central. But if you can suppress it, um, then it's peripheral. So that was a lot about nystagmus. So I'm going to show you some videos to hopefully clear some of that up. So this is peripheral horizontal. So um, this is a completely, let's say, benign um, nystagmus. So you see in primary gaze, her nystagmus is beating to her left. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's very intuitive. Like the direction that you want to name, it is. It, this is left beating nystagmus in primary gaze. It's kind of looking up a little bit, but still left beating. And she's going to look down, still left beating. It's kind of harder to see there. Looking to her left, still beating to her left. In the moment of truth, looking to the right, but still beating left. So her eyes are always pulled in the same direction. So contrast this with... So that was a left side problem. Yeah, that so this would be, um, yeah. would this... Because she's left beating. She's beating to the left. So she's beating to the left, so corrective phase is actually in the opposite. So you get pulled to your... Um, the bad side? The bad side. So it's right side, okay. So this, she would have a right side of problem. Okay, that's yeah. why I always mix it up. Yeah, I know. This is the one part that's not intuitive. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Well, I wish yeah. everything was beautiful, but no. it's, it's really not. Um, so compare this, or contrast this, with here. This is direction-changing nystagmus. So in primary gaze, it's right beating. Does that make sense? So always beating to her right. Eventually here she's going to look uh, left, or sorry, right. So still right beating. Getting pulled to her right side. But now it gets pulled in the other side. So this suddenly becomes left beating. Does everyone kind of see the difference there? So if you find your patient is always pulled, like his eyes, no matter what you do to them, they're always pulled in the same direction, that's very reassuring. They might just have like a vestibular neuritis, VPPD. Um, if you see this, and you can change the direction of the nystagmus based on where they look, that's direction changing. Uh, so that's bad. That's a central finding. I also wanted to show you vertical nystagmus. This is a little harder to miss, I'd say. Um, there's a bit of a trick with this. Because here, sometimes it's kind of hard to see. She has kind of upbeating vertical nystagmus. Uh, the best way to see, so there you see it especially. Best way to see is in down gaze because you can look at the eyelids. Mm -hmm. See that? Yeah, so vertical nystagmus usually has a little bit of a, of a dancey element that um, involve the eyelids. <clears throat> and torsional nystagmus, just because it's cool, so remember this can be either central or peripheral, but here um, it actually looks like, it almost looks like a steering wheel in the way it's rotating. See oh, that? Weird. I know, it's super cool. Yeah, I'll show it just one more time, because this is uh, it's interesting. She looks young. Mm -hmm. She's very young. So that's torsional. Yeah. All right. These are all the various nystagmuses. So um, that leaves the test of skew in our hints. So this is the easiest one, and it's a bilateral cover uncover test. So what you would do, if I can just look at you, you just get your patient to look at your nose and with keep looking at my nose, look at the same spot. So you'd cover, uncover their left eye, and you're looking at the behavior of their right eye. And then same thing, keep looking at my nose, cover their right eye, and you observe what their left eye is doing. Thank you. What you look for in this test is any vertical displacement of the iris when you cover the contralateral eye. So um, a common way to get tricked, and I got tricked a lot with this, is you're not looking for a horizontal movement, because uh, that can be normal in people who've just had like strabismus when they were younger. You're looking, when I cover this eye, is this one moving up? 
or down. Um, because the center that controls a vertical gaze is your inferior colliculus, uh, sorry, superior colliculus in your pond, so, or in your, um, I forgot actually where it is. But that hints that your vertical gaze is off, uh, and it's more likely in the brainstem. Um, I have a video for this as well. This, unfortunately, is probably my worst video, uh, because it shows a little bit of both, so it shows both um, inward movement and vertical movement, but I hope you still see it, the right eye. So you can see there's a very strong upward component. If you look at the lower border of the iris, it's a little hard to say because he has a bit of inward movement too. I'll just play it one more time. So this upward movement right there is what you're worried about. Okay. Of his right it's eye? Almost like his going, right eye, exactly. It's almost like going up. Yeah. yeah, it's going like almost this way, so like in and up. Yeah. So while you're covering his left eye, his right eye is, is skewing off. upwards. Exactly, okay. yeah. So if it's so, a square and then you, the pupil, you can mm. see it's getting wider. Exactly, so. and that's a really good um, way to look at these eyes. So look, actually look at how much sclera you see underneath your um, iris. Mm. And if you start seeing more, that means their eye is moving upward. Um, it's hard to sometimes look at the iris and, and tell, but... So, that is how to do a HINTS exam. Just to summarize what these findings would be, um, I wanted to do a quick uh, talk about um, terminology. So because, especially the head impulse, is sometimes a little counterintuitive to interpret, I would steer away from ever using terms like normal or abnormal HINTS exam, because if you ever say his HINTS exam was normal, your attending might be like get confused and say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean they didn't have a catch-up saccade? Because that would not be normal. So the terms I would use, just to be clear, is um, my patient had a peripheral type hints. So um, they had a present catch-up saccade in one direction and or horizontal unidirectional plus or minus torsional nystagmus and or vertical skew. Uh, no vertical skew. A central type hints would be um, no catch-up saccade in either direction and or direction changing nystagmus and or vertical skew present. And this is where you would investigate. Um, so that's how you would kind of fit that into your presentation, just to stay clear of any um, ambiguity. Also, quick point about terminology is Hintz versus Dix Hall Pike. So um, these exams ideally should never be used on the same patient, just because um, the Dix Hall Pike is what you use when you suspect BPPV as your most likely etiology. But if you suspect a stroke, you should be using hints. So usually your history should get you far enough down this process that you're pretty sure about your diagnosis and just using your physical to confirm. So you should usually not have to perform a Dix-Hall Pike and a hints at, in the same patient. Um, yeah, so your history should do most of the legwork actually in a patient with vertigo, which actually makes it very nice. Um, and remember, just because a lot of people mix up Dix Hall Pike and Epley, and I surely did, the Epley is actually a treatment. So despite being so similar, Dix Hall Pike and Epley are very different maneuvers that have very different goals. So Dix Hall Pike is diagnosis, Epley is actually a com completely a treatment. Um, as with every talk, before I uh, finish off, I thought I'd just use a quick patient synopsis um, to show you how you might present a patient to your attending. Um, and also, I just threw a few extra learning points in there. So there's a big block of text, so I'm going to just briefly uh, go over it, and then we'll talk about the individual si uh, parts of it. So let's say you saw Mr. Smith, he's 72, has this kind of sketchy cardiovascular history, is now presenting with what he calls dizziness, intractable vomiting, describes this as a feeling of self-motion. He remembers exactly when it started, it started very acutely, has been unremitting, and has a bit of a positional component. He has had no headache in the last 24 hours. When you did your HITS exam, it was central type um, with absence of vertical skew, presence of direction changing, and presence of catch-up saccade. So I know that this is possibly confusing, but I promise there's a learning point there and I'll come back to it. Um, gait was difficult to assess, but um, there was some white base gait, truncal swaying, and he always veered to the right. Given this, I'm concerned he may have a stroke, so I'd like to start with a non-contrast CT to rule out a bleed. If that's negative, I'd like to follow this up with an MRI to assess for ischemia of the posterior uh, ter territory.
So um, I want to go back to line five. So if everyone could follow me to his hints exam is central type. So if you go through this, I'm trying to make a point here and it might be a little counterbish. So absence of vertical skew would be what? Peripheral or central? Peripheral. Yes. Absence of vertical skew is a peripheral finding. Direction changing nystagmus would be what? Central, central peripheral. Central. central. And presence of catch-up saccade is peripheral. peripheral. So the point that I'm trying to make here, even though this patient only has one central finding, you structured your presentation to recognize that the exam, uh, the exam is not benign. Mm. So the learning point here is that even one central finding in your HINTS exam warrants further, ex uh, further investigations. Um, and that's the reason why it's so sensitive. Next learning point um, is some positional exacerbation. So I know positional immediately kind of makes us think uh, orthostasis or BPPV, but just know that if you're in the very acute phase, most patients with vertigo have some degree of positional component. So don't stop dead if you hear positional because sometimes in the early phase, it can still be in keeping with a central ideology. So just be aware of that. Um, this part, so the two underlined here, so denies any headache, and I'd like to proceed with a non-con CT to show that you've realized that ruling out a bleed is your first priority in any um, patient with vertigo if you think there are reasons to believe they might have one. Um, and lastly, the part in pink, tended to veer to the right, that's just more of a pearl. Um, veering consistently to one side is a pretty specific cerebellar finding, so that would localize to your cerebellum. And um, once again, very beautifully, patients usually tend to veer to the side of their lesion. So if he's con veering consistently to the right, there's a pretty good chance that he has either, that he has a right-sided cerebellar bleed or a stroke or tumor. So in summary, um, if you encounter a patient with vertigo, sort them into one of the four buckets that we talked about uh, based on your history. Um, sometimes it happens rarely that you actually narrow to two diagnostic buckets and you can't get much further. So just obviously combine your differentials, investigate on what you're worried about first. Um, if the history is suspicious for stroke, you should do a HINTS. And if you find even one central finding, you should order a CT plus or minus MRI. Um, if you suspect BPPV, do your Dix Hall Pike. And if it's positive, so if you find vertical or uh, torsional nystagmus, um, treat with the FA maneuver. And just my usual kind of throw in, um, it's kind of unfortunate that hints, because it's such a sensitive exam, unfortunately you have to actually be good at it in order for it to mean something. So try to just kind of find opportunities wherever you can to throw yourself into the fire and practice it and watch YouTube videos, especially if you're interested in any specialty that deals with these types of patients. <laughs> And of course, as per usual, I, I know this is a really dense talk with possibly a lot of new information, so um, I just, I'm still going to email you the one pager. If you were interested, just email me so I can reply to your email with this. Um, and I will be happily send that back to you. That's just a summary of today's talk and the main points. So um, that's it for today. Um, just quick plug so that the next talk is not happening next Tuesday but on February 11th, I'll post reminders as well. And as per usual, we can do questions. Um, but if you have anywhere to be, feel free to head out. That's fine too. I gotta go, but thanks, Rika. You're welcome. Thanks for coming. Awesome. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for doing this. Thank you.